I'm a lawyer, but uh, until recently I was a law professor. I don't know which is worse <laughs> from the perspective of the public perception, but in any event, um, I taught water law and property law and other things at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland for about 20 years and just recently went back into private practice and do water law and natural resource practice. Um, I'm going to try to give you, I'm not a scientist and you have plenty of scientists here. I'm focusing on the Western United States. Why? Because, uh, well, first of all, my job is to give you a legal and policy framework for how water management needs to adapt. You've already heard about some adaptive strategies and some management changes that can be made, but I want to give you the full perspective of the legal context um, so you can see how difficult that actually is to accomplish. I'm focusing on the Western United States, number one, because most, that's where most, most of you are, and this is a, a Pacific Northwest focused seminar. Um, but even those of you who are not from this part of the country need to care about water management in the West for a couple different reasons. One is that most of the food supply that is produced and consumed in this country now happens west of the 100th meridian, which is an important water uh, boundary. It goes basically right down the middle of the country, cuts off the panhandle of Oklahoma, that's how you can sort of remember where it is, East of that line, you don't need irrigation for agriculture. It, it helps, you know, uh, predictability and productivity and so forth, but you don't need it. West of that line, you need irrigation for agriculture. In the 1920s, 60 some percent of the food that was grown and produced in this country came from east of the 100th meridian where you didn't need irrigation. By the 1960s, that had flipped. And so now the West is in fact responsible for a great deal of the country's um, agricultural products and food supply. Just the Central Valley of California produces something like 45% of the uh, sort of produce that comes to you around, to everyone around the country. And of course, Oregon, where I'm from, we produce most of the world's hazelnuts. So if you like hazelnuts, you know, you also need to care about water management. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is how water management happens now, um, what changes will be needed to adapt to climate change, and what are the barriers to making that happen. Um, you've, you've seen this in great, beautiful, colorful detail from the two previous speakers. Generally, water supply is gonna go down, not in a straight line, but it's going to change. You know, the precipitation is gonna change primarily from rain to, I mean, from snow to rain in lots of places. Snowpack's gonna go down. Um, the hydrograph is gonna move earlier. So we have, you know, more runoff in the, in the earlier spring, less in the summer. And water demand is gonna go up. And that's not, that's for irrigation, the evapotranspiration needs that are already increasing, but also generally the need for greater irrigation to keep producing what we produce in this part of the country with warmer, drier, late summer conditions. Um, municipal demands are gonna go up. You saw from Heejung the, uh, the kinds of water use that happens in households with increased temperatures and energy related costs. I mean, there's, you, know, you hear about the energy water nexus a lot, that one of the greatest uses of water is, to, is for cooling and other um, processes of our energy production. And one of the greatest uses of energy is the movement and heating of water. So they are very, very closely tied. And the, as, particularly as we try to move away from our non-renewable resources and try to, to uh, change our source of energy as a mitigation measure for climate change, um, we're going to have more problems with energy-related uh, water issues. Okay, current water management, I, I'm very broad brush. There's a physical infrastructure and there's a legal infrastructure. And in the physical infrastructure, there are numerous facilities that are operated by um, federal, tribal, state, local, and private individuals or entities. Legal infrastructure, there's a huge, complicated tapestry of federal, tribal, interstate compacts, state and local authorities, and private parties. And you, you take the physical infrastructure, you superimpose the legal infrastructure on top of that, think of mental mylar, you know, a piece of mylar coming down on top of it, and you have a very complicated um, system that is, that is interdependent but not interwoven in the sense of coordinated, 
you know, there's a lot of fragmentation. Let me talk about this a little bit more. The physical infrastructure, and I should have put as the very first piece of physical infrastructure on this list, the snowpack, because in fact, the snowpack is one of the biggest water storage reservoirs that we have depended on in the past, you know, several decades. But in addition, we have a series of dams, reservoirs, ditches, pumps, pipes, wells um, throughout the West, or throughout the Pacific Northwest, that is designed around the hydrograph as we know it and the historical record of snowfall, precipitation, uh, runoff, floods, droughts, you know, those variabilities that um, my, the previous speakers showed you, we know they're there and they're not easy to deal with, but we have designed a physical infrastructure, you know, mostly around the historical record. Every single piece of the physical infrastructure has its own legal authorization and its own, you know, funding source or um, funding needs. Every single dam, you know, whether it's run by whether it's a, an individual stock pond, which is what that is in the middle there. Where's my, that's just an individual, you know, a small dam and an individual livestock pond. Um, that operates under a certain set of legal requirements. Uh, a great big hydropower dam, excuse me, like the um, Bonneville Dam or an irrigation dam. This happens to be the Cold Springs, which is part of the Umatilla project, Umatilla Basin project in Northeastern Oregon. Every single one of those has a different legal um, uh, statute giving it authority and a different institution or set of people running it according to those authorities. And that's true for irrigators, for municipal water providers, for industrial users, for individuals, and other you know, sort of quasi-public entities. And the general purposes overall, even though they're you know, the, these purposes can come, as I said, from federal, tribal, state, local law. But the general purposes are running it for water supply for these various different entities, um, having a facility that's primarily designed for flood control, but maybe it also provides some water supply or some, you know, recreation and things like that, or a facility like the Bonneville Dam, which is primarily designed as a run-of-the-river facility to produce electricity, but it also is part of that whole system of dams up and down the Columbia that are run, you know, for flood control, hydropower, irrigation, and so forth. Very complicated system. Okay, the legal infrastructure, and I know this is probably a little tricky to see. It's going to be on the website. Um, I knew when I was putting it together that it was going to be hard to read just because of the size, but I wanted to give you some sense of the organization chart of Western water management and Western water law. It's not an organization chart. I mean, in, in other words, you know, it's not like these, all these things really flow into um, each other the way they're, they're shown here, but there is a hierarchy, and that's what I wanted to show you. Okay, at the top of the hierarchy is federal system of federal laws that affect water management, including international treaties. I mean, right now, the Columbia River Treaty is in the process of building up to be renegotiated between Canada and the United States. Um, it has been, oper the, the Columbia River Treaty, when it was drafted, was primarily dealt with hydropower and flood control. This time around, you can bet it's going to have environmental components, tribal components, all, you know, ecosystem service components, all sorts of recreation, all sorts of different um, constituencies are now part of the process. And of course, on the other end of the country, we have uh, treaties with Mexico on the, notably the Colorado River, but also some other cross-border rivers. So the federal government has entered into these treaties and has obligations to deliver water in the case of Mexico or obligations to operate facilities according to these treaties. And then of course we have treaties with Indian tribes as well, and I'll come to that in a moment. But other aspects of federal law that Im impact water management, obviously, Clean Water Act, you know, which is primarily water quality pollution control. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is also, you know, geared towards water quality, but to uh, protect water for drinking purposes. The EPA is responsible, as the federal agency is responsible for implementing and uh, 
enforcing both of those. Then we have the Endangered Species Act, which brings in the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for the um, anadromous species. We have the Reclamation Act, which brings in the Bureau of Reclamation. We have flood control authorities, which bring in the Corps of Engineers. And then we have interstate compacts. And I put them over in this box with federal law because once Congress has ratified an interstate compact, it has the force of federal law. Now, at the same time, states have to agree to an interstate compact. They have to enact it into state law as well. But then it has the force of federal law. So those, all those things affect um, water management. We also then have, from the federal level, federal land management agencies and, and federally recognized Indian tribes with substantial land holdings. And all of these entities, any federal land that is dedicated to a particular purpose, which includes Indian reservations, national forests, wildlife refuges, military facilities, basically anything other than the unclaimed BLM land that's just sort of managed as Range land, but anything else that's specifically dedicated to a particular purpose has reserved water rights under federal law. What does that mean? It means that when the reservation was created, there was by implication enough water reserved to fulfill the purpose of that reservation. Now, that is huge when you're talking about um, Indian tribes, Indian reservations. And it's potentially huge when you're talking about national forests as well, because they are the headwaters of many of the western streams. The Supreme Court has been fairly generous with Indian reserved rights and pretty restrictive with national forest rights. The, the key to the Indian tribal reserved rights, though, is that they are recognized by law, they, are, they have the supremacy of federal law, and they have um, for the most part, they have not been exercised. In other words, they're inchoate rights hanging over the heads of everybody else who has been using water under the state system you know, for the past 100 years. I'll come back to that later. Um, one more thing I want to mention up here, of course, is the Constitution, because the Constitution includes the, um, the, the takings clause, which says property cannot be taken without just compensation by either, federal, either the federal government or the state government. Now what happens is that once you get down in the, to the weeds over here and you have state issued water rights, which are, are um, a type of property right, then you have people arguing that some of these other laws, like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, if it's affecting the way they're using their property right in a water right, then, then they fall back, you know, they say, superior to those statutes is the Constitution. And you can't necessarily use those statutes in a regulatory manner to take my property. Um, okay, uh, coming down on this side a little bit further, state water quality agencies, I've put them over here on the federal side because in most cases, the Clean Water Act has actually been delegated to a state agency for management by the state. It's federal law, but it happens through a state agency. Um, and then you have, I put over here, irrigation and special districts, which also are created under state law, but they were um, essentially uh, given a boost by the 1902 Reclamation Act as the preferred entities for the federal government to contract with for federally built Bureau of Reclamation irrigation projects. So they have an important role under the federal water management system as well as under state. Okay, state law, which in, you know, is, is everything you know about property and um, uh, all the other aspects of state law, including any interstate compacts. State water quantity agencies are the ones who decide water allocation and issue water rights. State water quality agencies, generally, I mean, Washington happens to put these in one agency. Smart. A few other uh, states do as well. Many states do not. So you have one hand of the state government handing out property rights and water use, and you have another uh, arm of the state government trying to implement these later adopted environmental laws, and the two are often um, head on in trouble. The state water quantity agencies issue water rights, um, and they're uh, in the West, they are prior appropriative rights, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But they, 
Everybody who uses water has to have a water right. A municipality, an irrigation district, an individual, a farmer, anybody gets a water right from the state, and then you also have these federal rights. The only way to bring these two systems together is through state adjudications, and there's been a big one in, um, in uh, the Yakima, big one in the Klamath, big one in the Snake Basin, um, but that tries to integrate the federal reserved rights with the state rights. Okay, this is the important thing. The prior appropriation doctrine, which is the water law doctrine in the West, says first in time, first in right. The people who were here first got the first water rights, and they are the best water rights. When there is a shortage, you cut off the juniors. You, go, you, know, you cut off the most recent person to use water, and you go all the way back until there's enough water for whoever is left over. And it's a use it or lose it doctrine. You have to keep using it, in order to keep your water right active. That gives consumptive uses and waste, obviously, an advantage. And then we have the federal overlay I talked about before. The existing systems plus climate change, the phys physical infrastructure you've already heard about, it's gonna be in trouble, right? I mean, the snowpack eliminates significant water storage. The um, uh, change in precipitation is completely, uh, you know, it's a whole new ball game for a system that has been designed around the historical record. Same with the altered hydrograph, same with increased demand. So the physical infrastructure is, is going to have difficulty. There is some a, a adaptation underway, and you're going to hear about this from the um, Seattle utility speaker, um, because certain water manager entities know they've got problems and they're already trying to develop their own adaptation strategies. Across the whole system, no, there is not adaptation going on. Um, okay, the legal infrastructure, this is what I want to, to finish up with. Um, in theory, the prior appropriation doctrine is the most highly adaptive doctrine you could have because it, sim it, it makes the rules, first in time, first in right. We, could, we don't have to do anything legally to adapt to climate change. As the water supply changes, you know, as the hydrograph changes, as the snowpack melts, as the water supply goes down, as the demands go up, you just apply first in time, first in right. No big deal, right? Well, it is a big deal, because what does that mean? It's often going to be the smallest, single family farmers raising the, and I use this as an economic term, not as a social term. The lowest value crops, you know, hay, forage, alfalfa, those are the ones with the senior water rights. Some mining companies around the West, um, the tribes, but most of them either haven't even been quantified through the uh, adjudication process or they've never actually exercised their rights, so they're paper rights only. Who's, the, who's gonna get cut off in a straight prior appropriation? Municipalities newer users, many of whom are much more efficient because they've had to be, because there isn't that much water left to hand out. Tribes, if they're not adjudicated or quantified, environmental uses and grounds, groundwater uses, which came later, generally. Or the federal government could just step in and say, we're gonna take care of this and preempt state law. That's never gonna happen in our lifetimes, I can tell you. Okay, so these are the quick, and, and I've you know, just listed a few things. Um, this is what has to happen to be truly adaptive to climate change. Get serious about water conservation. We are not very serious about water conservation. We have massive waste, particularly in the irrigation systems. Um, do integrated water planning. You heard the same thing from the previous speakers. And this means uh, we don't do this now. I mean, we need real-time data collection and distribution to all the managers. You know, when I said there are all these individual managers out there with the different facilities, we need to integrate land use and water use, as Hee Jung was just saying, groundwater and surface water, quantity and quality, consumptive uses and in-stream uses, and energy and water. None of this is built into the current system. It's just starting to happen in some places. And then we need to implement these integrated water resources plans on a watershed scale so that it's coordinated. And all of this is adaptation, not mitigation. I mean, I think we're sort of beyond the point of worrying about some mitigation. We need to build in flexibility, which is not there now. The prior appropriation doctrine is not flexible. Um, and by, in order to do that, we need to encourage water markets so that water rights holders can deal with each other and the water can find the highest value economic use or the highest social value use, depending on who's willing to pay for it. In order for that to happen, we actually 
have to put a price on water that's, that's fair market value. We need to re-examine our subsidies and we need to redesign our agriculture insurance programs which now, um, you know, sort of uh, not only agriculture insurance but also flood insurance. You know, we, we have a disaster mentality. We don't have a planning mentality on drought and floods and we need to change that. And uh, finally, we, need, we do need more storage. I mean, we're going to lose the snowpack. Our current storage is not um, designed for the changes we need, but it has to be totally different than the big dam era of the 1930s you know, on up. It needs to be smart storage. A lot of it is probably going to be aquifer storage and recovery because that eliminates the massive uh, reservoirs that are just going to evaporate anyway. We need to develop off-channel storage and we need to integrate all of that with energy needs. So if you have an off-channel storage, maybe it can also be um, you know, pumped storage facility to add um, energy as well. And we need to use every single pipe we have and put turbines in it <laughs> to generate power as well. Okay. Um, the barriers should be obvious from what I've said so far. The, the incredible fragmentation of the system, legally and physically, the sense of entitlements that people have about the way they use water now and their ability to turn that sense of entitlement into a takings claim under the U.S. Constitution, it's really a matter of risk allocation and cost. Who's going to pay for the change? Who, who's going to you know, take the brunt of the changes. Is it just going to be the junior appropriators? Is it going to be the municipalities? Um, and who's going to pay to make the changes we need? Because right now there's, there's no obvious, uh, you know, there's no connection between sort of the beneficiaries and the uh, actors in this whole area. Okay, if, if we're going to see, that's a terrible picture, I'm sorry, but if we're going to see increased, this, this is a precipitation map, obviously, if it's going to get worse and there's going to be less or altered precipitation, it's going to take act action, coordinated action, everywhere from the state capital houses and Congress down to the individual farmer or water manager in order to adapt to the climate change. And it is going to be very, very difficult. But we got to do it. Okay, that's it. Thank you.